Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this evening's Bruges Group meeting. It's my great pleasure to welcome Andrew Green, Lord Green of Deddington. Andrew is a career diplomat and before entering the diplomatic service in 1965, he served in the Royal Dream Jackets. In the House of Lords, Lord Green sits as a crossbencher. His diplomatic career focused on the Middle East, where he served in six posts, including three years as our ambassador in Syria and four and a half years as our ambassador in Saudi Arabia. He also served as the Foreign Secretary's Principal Advisor on the Middle East and spent two years trying on the Prime Minister's instructions to remove Islamic extremists from Britain who were claiming asylum in the British courts. Following this experience, he was in 2001 the founding chairman of Migration Watch UK. Many who voted to leave the European Union were deeply concerned about our inability to control our own borders and the consequent pressures that were being exerted on our public services. Free movement is also a crucial issue in our negotiations to leave the European Union. Tonight, we have someone to speak to us who has a deep and intelligent understanding of these issues. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please welcome Lord Green of Deddington. Uh, Mr Chairman, thank you very much for your invitation and for your welcome. Uh, before I start, let me just check you can hear me at the back. That sounds quite good, yes. Yeah. Um, it's always a good idea to check that at the beginning. <laughs> a colleague of mine forgot and asked the question halfway through. And uh, somebody at the back stood up and said, can't hear a word. <laughs> Matters got worse. Somebody at the front stood up and said, I can hear every word. <laughs> Let's change places. <laughs> so do feel free at the front if you <laughs> Um, Chairman, as you know, I speak to your group every three or four years, um, and each time I say to you there's been an enormous change since I last spoke, uh, and this time I can say that in spades, I think. We really are at a truly historic gesture, juncture. Uh, and furthermore, uh, I would argue that immigration is a large part of the reason for that conjuncture. When I last spoke to you in April 2013, I said there had been a sea change in the previous weeks. And what I was referring to was that all three party leaders, at that point there were only three, had been speaking about immigration. And that was news at that time. Perhaps you remember those days when uh, immigration was a subject that was very widely avoided. Uh, in fact, when, when I started my restaurant in 2001, the BBC would not even use the word. They called it in-migration. Well, in my last talk, I went on to suggest that the scale of immigration at the time posed the greatest threat we had ever faced to social cohesion in Britain. And indeed, the, the failure of the political class to address it had severely undermined public confidence in our political system. And looking back now, I think there was something in that verdict. <coughs> Uh, should have dealt with that before. Um, uh, now, as it's uh, some years since I spoke to you, let me just briefly say a word about Migration Watch, which, uh, to make it clear that we're a voluntary organisation, we're totally independent of the government, funded by private donations. And our aim is uh, to make the facts known so that the public can make up their own minds. It follows, of course, that we are open to dialogue with with all political parties, uh, but we make no secret of the fact that we are opposed to the current massive levels of immigration 
Uh, but we are in favour of moderate levels of migration, which, in our view, uh, is a simply a natural part uh, of an open economy and an open society. And it's something we've seen uh, in, in this country for a long time. Uh, people going in both directions, of course. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that we regard as, as natural and desirable. As regards the referendum itself, I should make it clear that, that we didn't campaign on either side. We thought that was not the right thing for a think tank to be doing. Um, instead, we tried to set out uh, some of the factual basis for the decision that people were having to take, a decision that many people found quite difficult, uh, and a decision that um, different parts of different families uh, came to in uh, different ways. And in the event... I think it's fair to say that the conduct of both sides in that referendum was, shall we say, open to challenge. But uh, however we may have voted, and I think I can guess uh, how this audience might have voted, um, th th there is one thing we, we can all agree on. Uh, this is why I started that this is a historic turning point for our society. So to come to my title, Brexit, Where Next on Immigration? <clears throat> I intend to speak for about 30 minutes and then invite you to, to fire at me. And I want to cover three broad issues. The first is, how did it come to this? Secondly, where do we go from here? And thirdly, what should be our objectives in the forthcoming negotiation with Europe uh, in respect of immigration? And I'm going to stick... Uh, on the whole, to broad outlines, I'll try not to be too techy, but there may be one or two places where I have to insert a little bit of detail. <clears throat> so, first of all, um, how did it happen? Well, I think it's hard to deny that the, that the result of the referendum was a clear decision. It wasn't a huge majority, but it was a clear decision by the British people and one that was, seems to be largely unforeseen by what one might call the <coughs> metropolitan elite. So has the um, immigration tail wagged the dog? Well, the decision didn't come entirely out of the blue. I think there had been growing doubts among many people as to the direction of travel of the European Union and whether it was right for Britain. Not, of course, we're not, of course, members of the Schengen area or not members of the Eurozone. And the prospects seem to be for more and more integration. Indeed, many would argue that that is essential if the Eurozone is to survive. And if you add to that the almost automatic response uh, by the European Commission to any problem, which is more Europe, then you, uh, in a sense, clearly have a, a, an organisation that is pointing to travelling in a particular direction. And to some, it was a train travelling headlong in the wrong direction and without any brakes. To others, of course, it was our historic European destiny. But beyond these, these general and, and, and really quite serious doubts, I think that the loss of control of our borders, as it was perceived, was clearly a major factor. Uh, the opinion polls are a bit um, discredited nowadays, um, but uh, just before the referendum, uh, there was an opinion poll that um, didn't prompt people. Obviously, you can adjust the question and you'll get the answer you want, but this was an unprompted uh, inquiry as to which is the most um, important issue to you in this, in this matter. Uh, and um, immigration scored 33%. Uh, the economy 28%. So nobody's saying it was the only factor, but it was clearly a major factor. Uh, and of course everyone had a whole range of considerations that they had to think about before they cast their vote. But I think it is worth looking at how immigration became such a potent factor, and indeed why it will continue to be a major factor as we go forward, unless and until... Uh, some effective controls are put in place. 
Um, immigration, I think, has been an issue in the UK for at least 50 years. But what has changed is its scale. Until 1998, um, net, the net inflow was seldom more than 50,000 a year, and sometimes it was even negative. It was in the year 2000 that immigration quadrupled in one year to 200,000, mostly from outside the EU. And that was a result of a series of changes put in place by the Labour government that had just come into power. But the, and it's important to remember this because we're now in a new situation where nearly half the immigration is coming from Europe and the other half continues to come from, from outside Europe. Uh, so the major long-term change in migration uh, came as a result of our membership of the European Union and it came in three phases. The first was in 2004 when you remember that uh, the uh, eight uh, at that time East European countries joined the Union and the UK, Sweden and Ireland were the only people not to have a transition period. And some of you will remember that uh, we were told by the government that there would be no more than 13,000 a year net. Well, we said at the time that that forecast was almost worthless. We were quite wrong. It was completely worthless. <laughs> uh, we said that three times that would be a low estimate. It turned out to be six times. I mean, it really was the most astonishing mis... It wasn't a calculation, actually. It was rubbish, and we said so at the time. But it certainly misled people, and it certainly led to a policy that of, of shall we say, unforeseen consequences. But in those early years, we were brushed aside. We were told, oh, well, they're temporary. They'll, they'll all be gone after the summer, or they're only, only, only here for a few months. Well, that too proved to be wrong. In fact, most uh, East Europeans who come here stay... Um, quite considerable periods. Um, then the second wave uh, in more recent years was really, I think, almost certainly you could say was the, uh, the effect of the Eurozone crisis, um, which has produced massive levels of youth unemployment in southern Europe. I mean, levels that, that, that we can hardly imagine here. Uh, last summer, Greece, 48%. Spain, 43%. Italy, 39%. I mean, what does that do to a society? It really is very serious for them and, and, and for Europe as a whole. And then lastly, the third wave uh, has come from Romania and Bulgaria who followed on uh, in Eastern Europe. And um, our forecast, which was uh, derided at the time, was 50,000 a year. It's turned out to be pretty well spot on. So, by 2016, when we, when we had this sort of a referendum, Net migration, as you all know, had reached 330,000, nearly half of it from the European Union. 330,000, that's nearly a third of a million a year. I mean, no wonder there was quite extensive public concern. And none of this, apparently, had been foreseen. Nothing had been planned to provide the necessary extra public services. Now, uh, many uh, EU migrants are uh, in lower skilled employment and they're very good workers. A every employer will tell you that, uh, whatever their pay and conditions. Uh, I remember talking to someone, um, let's say, in East Anglia, who had a, a business that employed 70 East Europeans. He said, they're wonderful. I said, oh, yeah. Do you pay them um, the minimum wage? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, they, they do it 50 hours a week, they'll work. I said, what do you do about overtime? Oh, we don't have overtime. I mean, th that's wrong. Uh, whoever, the, whoever the worker is, to expect them to work in this country for 50 hours a week and pay no overtime, I think it's just wrong in principle. But, and I'm not saying by any means that all employers of East Europeans do that. But clearly, um, they are, well, frankly, I think quite a lot of them are being exploited. Um, but uh, they are here, and, and of course many are very welcome, but we have to recognise that the inevitable consequence of immigration on, on the present scale is that our population as a whole, UK this is, population will grow by uh, half a million a year for the foreseeable future. That is equivalent to building the city of Liverpool 
every year. And three quarters of that will be a result of immigration. And 90% of that increase will be in England. And it means, just to take one example, it means that in England uh, we will have to build a new home every four minutes just to accommodate new migrants. Now, personally, I think that makes no sense. But I don't imagine that um, the public were aware of these statistics. Uh, you know, they tend to go in one ear and out of the other for most of us. Um, but I think they were, in very general terms, aware of the impact of immigration on this scale uh, and its real consequences on the ground. Communities all over Britain had personal knowledge of fellow workers who'd lost their jobs or had their pay rate cut as a result of, of immigration, uh, often from Eastern Europe, or Europe anyway. And, of course, they were well aware of the pressure on housing, especially social housing, schools, GPs, maternity units, and so on. But, you know, perhaps no less important was what I think was a widespread feeling that the political establishment was in denial. Those who had concerns about immigration <coughs> felt condescended to. It was implied that they, you know, they didn't understand the great benefits of immigration for our economy. They're a bit stupid, really. If only they knew about economics, they'd know what a very good idea it was. Uh, and there were even uh, suggestions of racism and xenophobia, <coughs> sadly, still echoed sometimes today. In my view, nothing could have been more counterproductive. The public had had enough, so much so that one third of, of all Labour voters voted out, uh, and 60% of Conservatives also giving a clear, not overwhelming, but a clear majority of a million votes. So there's no going back. We are now where we are, and in my view, any attempt to negate the outcome of the referendum would be enormously <coughs> resented and would certainly be a serious blow to confidence in our entire political system. So, second part of my talk is um, about the way forward. Where do we go from here with the immigration portfolio? The Prime Minister's speech at the opening of the Conservative Party conference uh, included a very important signal. She made it clear that the principle of control over immigration is not and cannot be a matter for negotiation. As she put it, we're going to leave the European Union and that means we're going once more to have the freedom to make our own decisions on the way in which we control immigration. I'm not sure that the importance of this was entirely grasped at the time, but what it means is that we will draw up plans for controlling immigration from the European Union and elsewhere uh, and then discuss it uh, with our partners. So, how should we now proceed? Um, Migration Watch has set out some draft proposals which are based on the principle that uh, free movement between the UK and Europe should be uh, disrupted as little as possible. Uh, as Boris Johnson put it, we're leaving the EU, but we're not leaving Europe. And we have a huge network of social, business, historical ties with all parts of Europe. And I'm sure everyone in this room has ties with Europe, different parts of Europe, different reasons. Uh, and I think everyone here would like them preserved uh, as much as possible. So what we suggested is that, um, except for workers, and I'll come to workers in a minute, there should be no restrictions at all on other Europeans uh, coming to Britain. That is to say that tourists, students, those who are financially self-sufficient, like uh, uh, pensioners, um, those who are genuine marriage partners, should face no barriers, indeed no visas. And, of course, it would have to be reciprocal. Uh, but uh, in... Um, and I imagine the other member states would, would be willing to go along with that for very similar reasons. Um, but the, 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 the situation in terms of, of, of workers is, is somewhat different. Um, 
we have to reduce the numbers of low-paid workers if uh, the outcome of the referendum is to be respected. Fortunately, the facts are rather helpful. Um, of all uh, EU uh, citizens who come here as migrants, that is to say that when they arrive, they're, they're coming from all the year. That's, as you know, the definition. Of all EU migrants, 70% come here to work or uh, to seek work. So that they are, in broadly speaking, workers. And something else, too. Uh, 80% of those who have arrived in the last 10 years are in low-skilled and low-paid employment. But those facts, are, I think, are not terribly well known, but we're, we're trying to make them better known. Uh, so, and they point clearly, it seems to me, uh, to the introduction of a work permit scheme, which will be confined and will confine EU migration to skilled people uh, coming here to work. Uh, and, and the way to do that is to, to wrap EU workers into the same system that we have for workers from the rest of the world. And that actually would achieve a remarkable decrease uh, in uh, net migration from Europe of the order of 100,000 a year. So numbers are tricky, but I invite you to remember these three, man, three, these three numbers. 70% arriving for uh, work, 80% in low-paid work, and a reduction of 100,000 in net migration. That seems to me not a bad approach to the issue. But, of course, life isn't quite as simple as that. Uh, there are people called employers... Uh, who are making a great deal of money um, and they uh, will be strongly opposed, I think, uh, to changes of this kind um, because they've, some of them have become heavily reliant on virtually unlimited cheap overseas labour. Some people say we've got into a situation where the minimum wage is actually the ma maximum wage because that's all you have to pay to get a worker. So why should you pay any more? Uh, and, and in parts of the country, I think that is uh, what has happened. But that said, uh, these guys, they're not going to disappear in a puff of smoke. I mean, they're here for a good reason. They're making good money. They're sending it home. They're building a house, whatever it may be. Uh, so they will be here, uh, and that will allow the employers time to make the adjustments that are necessary. Now, that could be improving pay and conditions so as to get uh, British workers to do the job. Let me tell you another anecdote. I don't know whether you remember seeing um, press reports that uh, a, a firm in um, Northampton that makes sandwiches uh, had set up a new plant and they needed 250 workers and they imported from Hungary 250 workers. All of them, a whole lot. And um, so we looked into that and uh, we got hold of the advertisement because you have to advertise in the UK as well as in Europe. It's called local, local advertising. And um, we looked at the advertisement. Sure enough, it said, to apply for this job, you have to, be, have to be available seven days a week, 24-7, because you're going to be working at night, you're going to be working at the weekend. Oh, yeah. How many British workers with children in school, families, other commitments can uh, apply for a job on that basis? Of course they can't. <coughs> and the company knew it. The, the, the advertisement was fixed. It's perfectly possible, and many people do it, to organise their workforce around, to, within limits, around the capabilities and availability of their workers. Most of your firms do that, I'm sure. Some well, a year or two later, I happened to be talking to Ian Duncan Smith, who was the um, uh, Secretary of State for Employment at the time. And I mentioned this case to him. He said, oh yeah, I remember that, he said. We asked the job centre in Northampton whether they, had, in turn, had been asked to find some workers. Answer? No. They weren't even asked. Now, if that kind of thing is going on, in my view, it's got to stop. Um, and uh, I hope that there will be measures taken to ensure that it, it does stop. But that's really to say that there will be a period of time in which employers can 
find other ways to do this, like advertising sensibly that might actually get you your workers. Uh, they could even try improving uh, productivity. In some things you can, by investment, of course, reduce your demand for labour. But why would you do that if you've got an endless supply of very low-paid labour? Of course you're not going to do it. You, you've got a business model that's making a packet. Who's going to change that? Of course they won't, unless they have to. So, that, we think, is the way forward. Of course, uh, EU countries will, will reciprocate. They will say, um, well, if you want people to come to Britain to, from Britain to, the, to Europe, then they must have a work permit as well. Okay. They have, they're bringing into effect a thing called a blue card scheme. We've looked at that. Uh, we see, see no reason why that should pose any particular difficulty for a British worker who wants to work in Europe. Um, I'll leave that there. Now, of course, when it comes to immigration, the devil is always in the detail. But, so I've just sketched out a rough way forward, uh, which we think could provide a satisfactory outcome for business, and one which uh, respects the very clearly expressed views of the British public. <coughs> this brings me to the great debate about hard Brexit and soft Brexit. I won't go into detail. Uh, let me say just that um, these terms are very misleading. The distinction that matters uh, is between membership of the single market and access to it. They're very different things. Uh, the EU have been clear that membership requires free movement. Uh, because they believe that if they allowed uh, membership without free movement, it would undercut the whole basis of the European Union. Well, that's for them to judge. But if that's what soft Brexit means, if it means in effect that we accept continued free movement in order to retain our membership of the single market, then I think uh, there will be a lot of people who didn't think that that was um, consistent with the outcome of the referendum. I think they would say that soft Brexit in effect means no Brexit. By contrast, access to the single market is something quite difficult, uh, quite different. Uh, that is uh, something uh, available to the entire world on trade-related terms. Thailand, America, Colombia, they all export into the European Union, and we could do the same uh, on terms that we will need to negotiate. But that, we think, is where the negotiation should be. So to conclude the second part of my talk, on the immigration chapter, I submit that the situation had become untenable. A hundred million people in these East European countries, at a standard of living about a third or a quarter of our own, a continuing substantial inflow was a racing certainty. And of course, it's well known that if you have a diaspora in, in, in another country and if there's a big uh, economic incentive to move, then you will get uh, large and usually growing levels of migration. And of course at the same time, as I mentioned, in some southern countries, uh, very high levels of, uh, of youth unemployment are not just a pull factor, they're a push factor as well. <laughs> so one last number in this chapter for you to remember is that our estimate of uh, the impact on net migration from the European Union. If we stay in uh, with free movement, if we reach a trade deal that involves free movement, uh, we reckon that immigration from Europe will continue at about 150,000 150, a year, well into the medium term. And it's this prospect, which I would argue, is, is hanging over the entire negotiation. I mentioned immigration a third of a million for the foreseeable future. I mentioned the population of Liverpool every year, 90% in England. So I think that the public can now see very clearly that the whole scale and nature of our society is being changed, and importantly, and without their consent. Now, I would argue that all this should have been apparent both to leaders of our own country and of the EU. 
but it's brushed aside in a manner that I think has done nothing for the standing of the political class. <clears throat> I come now to the last part and shorter part of my talk. <clears throat> You'll all be well aware that um, there have been widespread calls for the government to set out their objectives and strategy before Article 50 is, is triggered uh, by the end of March. I just can't see how they could set out their strategy in public. I mean, I think that's just damn silly, uh, and I don't think that anyone is going to really push for that. <clears throat> um, overarching objectives are a different matter. I think if they were framed in a sufficiently neutral manner, they would reveal nothing uh, to the EU that they couldn't work out for themselves. But, on the other hand, they would illustrate for the British public the ground to be covered and provide some kind of reassurance as to what is going on. Um, and in fact, we therefore published our own objectives this morning. Uh, we listed what we thought were the ten main ones. Uh, I will just run through them very quickly. Um, the first is that rights of EU citizens here and British citizens there should be guaranteed. There have been developments on that recently that didn't help. Uh, second, visa-free access uh, except for workers. I've mentioned that. Third, genuine marriage should not be restricted. Fourth, uh, EU nationals who wish to work should be required to get work permits. I've mentioned that. Uh, fifth, we might need a, some kind of a key workers scheme in a transitional way. Sixth, transfers between international companies should be unrestricted. These are very senior people who, who circulate around the world. Uh, and that's a position for non-EU now. Uh, seventh, there should be no access to uh, income and housing benefits for five years for EU citizens, as is the case for non-EU. Uh, eight is more difficult. The common travel area with Ireland should continue. Nine, uh, the overall... Uh, we might come back to this. Uh, the overall package should take account of the interests of devolved uh, in administrations, uh, Scotland, Wales, and so on. Uh, and lastly, um, although it's not a matter for the EU, uh, it should be an, obje an objective to uh, retain the juxtaposed controls at Calais uh, and Dover. Now, of course, as you will readily appreciate, uh, each of these objectives is the tip of a very large, uh, a very large iceberg. Uh, and you probably know that the immigration rules run to about 1,400 pages, uh, and the uh, guidance is even more extensive. However, to conclude, we now have a massive task before us. But the good news is that the eventual outcome will leave us in control of our borders our laws, and our future.